back to uh, for, for the second session of the track today. We have uh, a great present presenter for you, uh, presenting the Open Stack way. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Bill Franklin. Hello, welcome to the OpenStack Summit. Um, I got we've got people still coming in, so if you can move that way, that might be great. I have a couple of questions, just since you guys, it's day one for you, you're going to be exhausted at the end of the week, so if I get you to move and be a little bit more active, it may be more comfortable for you. For um, How many people in the room, this is your first summit? Okay, how many people in the room have been to at least five summits? Okay, so for those of you that, that it's your first summit, um, drink lots of water, it's exhausting, it's a marathon, it, it starts in the morning, it goes till late at night. Uh, if you're here for the design summit, um, really drink a lot of water, because uh, you're, you're gonna be in rooms with lots of developers doing a lot of talking, and often discussions start, you know, there's a few developers in the room, sometimes, sometimes they add, add things and it'll start at seven in the morning, it'll go until nine or 10 at night. Um, so we get a lot done at these summits, but it's pretty involved. Um, one or two other really short questions. How many people are here because they work for companies that are interested in cloud computing? Okay. Um, I mean, mo mo most people maybe, I don't know. Uh, but how many of you are here because you're actually developers who want to work on or hack on uh, OpenStack itself? Okay, so a number, a number of you guys are building the infrastructure. A lot of you are working for companies that are gonna either install the infrastructure or consume the infrastructure and run applications on it. So what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna briefly talk about today in the, I think I've got about 40, 45 minutes left, is talk a little bit about the, the landscape of enterprise IT. What's going on in enterprise IT right now and kind of where it's going. Um, OpenStack and cloud software, but specifically in the enterprise, right? So, so if you are, you know, here from a small research facility or something else, you know, I'll be talking about how your facility might be using it, but I'm not necessarily going to be talk about, talking about advances in OpenStack, uh, you know, from a research perspective. That's one of my talks later. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at HP inside OpenStack and how we're trying to deliver OpenStack solutions to the enterprise, and then just briefly touch on, if I have time at the end, sort of this whole maturation of the OpenStack ecosystem for the enterprise. So what's, what's actually going on in enterprise IT right now? And, and while wow, trying to read white and blue on the slides at the bottom is really hard. Um, so IT has really become very, very integral to uh, business success. Um, more and more of, um, it really is hard to read these, more and more companies really need to innovate really rapidly and, and quickly and change what's going on. Uh, give you an example of that. Uh, how many of you here are from Europe? Okay, how many of you here have heard of Europe? Okay, that's good. Um, um, imagine, you know, Greece exits the Euro, and we, and we wind up into a two or three, ta uh, two or three stage currency market, okay? The first investment bank that puts up the currency swap systems will probably capture anywhere from two to four billion euros a month in terms of fees and benefits and other things associated with basically running that currency exchange. Okay, so, so that's a real world situation in as rapidly as you can innovate to the changing times as to what happens, you get to capture, you know, revenue from that, okay? Another thing that's going on, which is represented by here, there's more than, there's more people registered for this conference, uh, I think they're coming from more than 140 different countries, right? We all work for a very global workforce, we all have a very global customer base. HP does business in more than 180 com countries. Okay. Um, so you need to be able to cooperate with all those people and collaborate. Um, the digital data explosion has just been absolutely mammoth, right? It's been, it's been really huge. And then on the technology side, there's massive explosions with, with lots of things. Um, we're seeing sort of over the next two, two years a two to three times growth in, in global cloud infrastructure. Um, we're seeing a massive amount of growth in intelligent edge services. We're seeing anywhere from 
a 50 to 80 percent increase of new cloud applications or cloud applications that deal with, with big data. And we're seeing a huge expansion of both cloud apps, but also cloud development. And when I talk about cloud, I'm talking about dynamic elastic infrastructure, okay? People have talked about, you know, a uh, dense data center, let's virtualize every application I have, I'll put a web front end on it and I have a cloud. I'm not talking about that. Um, in the second paradigm or second revolution of infrastructure computing, you wrote your application, if you wanted it highly available, you clustered the underlying infrastructure. If it wasn't running fast enough, you bought faster machines. You know, assuming you, write, you wrote tight code, if your in-memory data set got too large, you put more memory in it. So you affected scalability, reliability, size by modifying the underlying infrastructure. In the cloud world, a cloud-native application needs to operate a different way. It's stateless, reliability, and, and other things are built into the app, not the infrastructure. So we consider sort of cloud computing, when we talk about it at HP, we're really talking about this third revolution of computing. So finally, in this, in this third revolution of infrastructure computing or the new style of, of IT, if you want to think about it that way, people are really striving for no vendor lock-in, they're striving for portability of their workloads, and they're really concerned about driving down their, their lowest co their total cost of ownership. Okay? If you deal with the financial market sector, what is the most expensive thing for them right now? It's actually capital. Um, as a result of both the Lehman collapse and a number of currency collapses, the cash reserves that banks need to hold now are anywhere, depending on which country you're in and what type of operations they do, anywhere from four times as large as they were 10 years ago to, in some countries and some regulatory spaces, 180 times more cash than they needed to hold before. So for a significant amount of the financial industry and financial services, the cost of capital to them is one, if not two orders of magnitude greater than it was 10 years ago. So when we talk about driving down total cost of ownership, it's always been a, a snag word that people go, okay, everybody wants to run, run more cheaply. But if I put it into real terms for you, you deal with certain industries now for which their available capital is far, far different than it was 10 years ago. And, and that's sort of the business tone of what's going on. Also, as machines become more and more efficient and more and more, more and more powerful, power consumption has gone up, real estate has gone up. So the desire to get smaller data, data centers, highly more efficient, but also be able to flex when you need demand, burst to other things. Firms are really changing how they work, right? So IT becomes an internal service provider at a company, okay? Um, and the other thing that H is happening in industry is a term that HP actually started a long time ago, which seemed to make complete sense for me a long time ago, three and a half years ago in the cloud world, which is hybrid, hybrid cloud computing. Part of our fundamental core belief is that enterprises will not move all to a public cloud. How many of you work for companies that have been in business for more than 50 years? Okay. Um, how many of you guys still have workloads in those companies that run on a mainframe? Uh, eight or nine of you are raising hands. How many of you still have workloads that run on Unix servers? I didn't say Linux, I said Unix. Okay. So my, my point behind that is that stuff didn't disappear. It's not going to disappear overnight. We're going to work in it. We're going to work in an environment. If you work for any company that's over a certain year, a certain age, or that's over a certain size, you're going to have hybrid workloads. You're going to have Check clearing again in banks. Often part of it runs on a mainframe, part of it runs on some Linux servers, part of it is web-based. All those things need to come together, right? You may migrate some of those workloads to a cloud, you may re-implement some of them, but you're not going to change them. Okay, one of the largest banks in the world, largest retail banks in the world, 65% of all of the code still running in production is written in COBOL and runs on a mainframe. Okay, now, I'll combine with that and say that 90% of all the new code that they write is written in one of two languages and either runs on an OpenStack implementation or runs on a variety of other cloud technologies, right? So they are living in a world where they have both legacy systems, they have stuff running on their own private clouds internally, their own private elastic dynamic infrastructure, and they have some stuff that they've moved out that runs on cloud technology managed for them by a third party. Not a public cloud, it runs in a single, uh, single tenant environment. So that's, that's what we talk about hybrid. And what's happening now is almost 30% of the, 
of all of the enterprises in, in this particular Frost and Sullivan survey, which was, I think, about 600 different companies, 30% of them are actually either cloud is crucial to their business or a percentage of their workloads are already starting to run on cloud. So this is a technology that is rapidly being adopted. We are shifting to it and enterprises are using it and they are using it in a hybrid-like manner. Okay. So all being most people in the room are engineers or ha have some engineering background or at least took a math class or a science class at some point in their life. So one of the things we do in sort of engineering and science is, you know, we get down to first principles and we talk about, you know, that classic word definition of terms. So I'm going to define a few terms. I already talked about cloud, elastic dynamic computing, infrastructure. We talk a little bit about when I say traditional apps, Right? I'm talking about the traditional way that we used to build applications. Right? We would decide we're going to have some applications. We'd either write them in-house internally. Let's not even get into how long that is. Monty already gave you some allusions to that earlier. But we write some applications or we purchase some applications. We want those applications to run, so we need to provision some equipment for that. Often that means we need to actually go out and buy some things, so we procure them. We might have to talk to other services. We need to get those services to give us access. God forbid you want to do a table scan on a big installed Oracle database in a financial service. Um, so you got to get permission to do that. You got to get all that stuff lined up. Then you have to configure all of those resources. Then after you've got all the machines and you've got it all configured and you've got all of the permissions to talk to all the different things you want, then you actually get to install the software and then you actually have to integrate all of it. And this stuff takes often weeks to provision, and this is being carefully generous. One, one uh, particular company I talked to, from the period for which they decide they're going to do something and they get the budget approved, it takes 18 weeks to get through their procurement cycle. Even if HP is really blazingly fast, they get hardware in maybe four weeks. And then it takes them, and this is the one that I found astounding, it takes them nine weeks to get it off their loading dock into a data center and get it available. So the period I just described is, you know, it takes less time to actually have a baby than it does to actually get this hardware um, for that particular company, okay? So you can only imagine why people wanted to move to a scenario where they could automatically provision things. So what kind of happens in the cloud world, just again, my sort of definition of terms, let's talk about cloud native apps. These are the applications for which, you know, it's somewhat stateless, they run in this elastic dynamic infrastructure. So the developer actually gets to build the app and the application and specify how it's all going to work. Right? They then push that code out into the cloud. For, this is a DevOps model. I could use Andreessen's term, you know, in, infrastructure as code. But it, it pushes it out there and you instantly provision the environment. And then the cloud, if it's a well-written application and it takes advantage of all of the native cloud services, it can automatically scale some of its resources. It can do a lot of resiliency, restart. It can do a lot of self-healing and a lot of other things. This environment is usually instantly provisioned and the application winds up being managed as a service by the application developers themselves in a traditional DevOps model. Okay. When you do that, Okay, we're trying to extract the development experience away from needing to basically configure and run all of the infrastructure. Okay? Now, how many of you out there actually are programmers or started your careers as programmers or have some amount of technology behind it? Okay. So, um, I started my career a, a really long time ago. Um, and I, my first job out of school was actually, I was a Unix kernel engineer hacking on writing device drivers for a living. So I spent the first five or six years of my career writing system level kernel code. My point behind this is that, you know, my view of a user land application developer was somebody who called the system call interface. I then moved along in my career and started managing an applications development group and found out that nobody calls the system call interface. They all sit at a much higher level. My point behind this is that the application developers of today, particularly in the cloud space, <clears throat> they're not writing code all the way down necessarily at the OpenStack API level. They're writing code at a slightly higher level of abstraction. They're writing code often at a PaaS layer. That's Cloud Foundry, Pivotal, everything that live in that world. Or they themselves write an abstraction <clears throat> if you deal with a large bank or you deal with um, 
you heard the Walmart keynote or, or, or others, people write an abstraction above that infrastructure so that they write all their applications to that. And this cloud native app model supports a lot of that type of capability. So you wind up with cloud native apps that as don't assume node failure, they avoid local storage, they're stateless, <coughs> often they're multiple processes, and where they need to deal with state, <coughs> excuse me, they're talking to servers um, and services that are reliable, and they're doing and speaking to those through service connections, and those connections need to be able to be transient. Just as we have sort of an open source manifesto and a number of different things around agile development and others, if you're really curious about this way of building cloud native apps, um, there's kind of a manifesto in this space called the 12-factor app. You can go and you know, Google it on the internet or go to 12factor.net. But it speaks a lot about this concept of cloud native application development. So if you want to move to the cloud and you want to start building applications that live in this space, Today we kind of live in the traditional world where you have IT ops, they're over here. Usually they have people guarding all of their equipment and it's behind fences and they run all of that. And you know, I go back to the early days of Unix and usually the sysadmin guys had big hiking boots on and jeans and carabiners with large amounts of keys and all sorts of stuff. Um, and those were the people who managed the network and the storage and the operating system, partially the virtual machines. And then developers lived way up higher than that, and often they were in different buildings, and you know, the stuff didn't work very much with each other. Now what's kind of shifted is that IT operations winds up really building a bunch of automated application services, compute as a service, storage as a service, all the things that OpenStack has been building for the last four years. And then developers are consuming those services and sit on top of it, and they orchestrate or marshal how all of those services work together. Okay? We are shifting one of the things that's happening in OpenStack, as Monty was talking about earlier, and some of the other people will be speaking about later today. We're shifting OpenStack a little bit as a community, not, not necessarily our product directions. OpenStack as a community is starting to shift to the aspect of we now need to cultivate application developers to write the applications for our infrastructure. We built really cool infrastructure, but infrastructure without apps to run on it is not necessarily very exciting, <clears throat> unless you're an operating systems geek and you're just interested in about building the operating system. So OpenStack is doing things. That's partially why we have the product working group. Um, I was co-chairing uh, with Chris Kemp an activity around the developer ecosystem. So that's another thing that's happening. I think the ISV um, ecosystem thing is on Thursday. So please come to that if you're interested in how we make OpenStack more attractive to ISVs and software as a service companies. <clears throat> but as we move from the today world to the future world on the cloud native apps, a couple of other things also wind up happening. So if you, if you want to build a PaaS layer or an abstraction or make an environment where enterprise IT builds these applications, you, you have to have both a combination of infrastructure as a service and this PaaS type of abstraction. It has to support a broad environment, right? A polyglot of, of environments. Java, I'm an ex-Sun guy, so Java's first on my list. Python, Ruby, even .NET, and a whole slew of other things. And people want to be able to move things around in a variety of different ways, right? So they're looking at OpenStack. They're looking at Cloud Foundry from a PaaS perspective. They're looking at Docker. They're looking at different types of virtualization strategies, different types of orchestration strategies. So where we're really moving to is this capability of enabling cloud native applications with a rich set of support for, for different environments and ensure portability and flexibility. And what's also happening though in parallel with all of this is companies are shifting more and more from using traditional proprietary software products to a broad adoption of open source. Okay? Um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Right? All software was pretty much proprietary. Companies wanted it that way. When we sold them software, there were escrow agreements. There were all sorts of other things in case anything happened. Right? And, and that provided a huge amount of lock. 
And you had things like Linux, you had things like Apache, you had things like the GNU project, you had a variety of things. And a bunch of things happened that shifted. So enterprises now are more interested in getting open source technology than proprietary. Why? They don't have vendor lock-in. They don't deal with complex software escrow agreements. They don't deal with a lot of other things. But it's also much easier to find people who know how to program in all of these technologies and administer all of these technologies. And when you have a problem, there's a huge community you can go to to get information about it. So we're seeing this massive, massive adoption of, of open source. It's really been going on for the last 20 years. So that a combination of both this migration to cloud and movement to cloud, it being hybrid and open source, are really the three things that frame HP's overall strategy of what we're doing. So what HP's done is our vision is really to build HP Helion, which is a portfolio of cloud products and technologies, from infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, uh, AWS solution built around eucalyptus, a variety of other technologies. Um, we're really building HP Helion based on OpenStack technology as the bottom from an infrastructure perspective in a developer-led, completely open source-based distributed world. Okay? And we're focused on, on doing that <clears throat> to be able to deliver really what we feel is open source that's enterprise ready for companies. So using the drivers that caused enterprises to choose open source, <coughs> excuse me, cost savings, portability, <coughs> don't eat two handfuls of cashews before you speak. Um, most of the drivers around open source, as I was saying, cost savings, portability, really it's an open standards type way of doing things, avoiding an aspect of being locked into anybody because you can somewhat switch from one vendor to another if they're all based on the same open source technology. And then he, what we've done at HP is add to that 24 by 7 by 365 global support, fairly rich integration space, done work in areas around security, maturity, and building out the overall ecosystem. Um, HP actually is one of the people who leads the security working group and activities around OpenStack. Um, Monty didn't allude to this earlier, but we do a huge amount of the work of running all of the continuous integration, the smoke testing, the Tempest environment, and everything for the OpenStack community. So if you ever do a putback to OpenStack, how many people in the room have ever committed code to the project? One, two, three, four, five, six, okay. All of your code, all that putback goes through a whole bunch of infrastructure that HP hosts and takes care of for the whole OpenStack community. So we do a lot of this work around part of this, but those benefits provide not only to the community, but also to our customers who consume this, right? Because it, allow, it allows us to do things. So what we've done is HP has built a product called HP Helion OpenStack, which is based on, it's a standard, standard distribution of OpenStack that all of you are pretty familiar with. Um, and then we built on top of that a development platform based on Cloud Foundry called HP Helion Development Platform that kind of marries a combination of OpenStack combined with Cloud Foundry com com combined with all of the things that an enterprise would want running a distribution like this on top of things that are all based from open source and from the drivers of cloud-enabled cloud application development. So it's really kind of this nexus of these three activities. Um, we are currently shipping uh, HP Helion OpenStack, I think it's 1.1.1, uh, um, and Cloud Foundry, um, our dev platform, also did a recent release. And when Tim, who I saw sitting somewhere, he'll be up in a while with a number of customers of ours uh, that'll talk about their engagement with HP and some of the technology. I've always found I can stand up and tell you all about what other people are doing, or I can have them stand up and tell you about what they're actually doing. They're far more interesting than I am anyway. Um, so what are the things that we felt were crucial to delivering into these? So we've spent a lot of time working on issues around security, um, on issues around configuration. As Monty was, Monty was showing you earlier some of the challenges of, of standard OpenStack. 
So we've spent a lot of time really focused on this. Uh, some of our newer, newer releases include things around encryption of data in transit, um, a lot of visibility around some of, some of the um, transactions and logging that's going on. One of the other things that HP is capable of doing is we have a wealth of enterprise class applications out of HP software. Things around security, things around networking, things around identity, things around storage, also significant things around application development, application lifecycle, application test. So we've done a lot of work on integrating HP's broader software portfolio into this. So things like uh, specifically around ArcSight, the HP's product CSA, um, Opsware, a lot of the other technologies that HP has. Many of those technologies are probably already in your enterprise. And part of our hybrid strategy is not only just the fact you're going to have hybrid clouds, but bridging to the technologies that you're already using in that space. Meaning, if you have a bunch of Unix machines and Linux machines and they're being managed by HP technologies now, you should be able to add cloud technologies and have those same management tools be able to work with them as well. So we've tried to focus on being able to extend those, and that goes to a lot of our security products. Um, I've already mentioned some of the, some of the cloud management aspect. Um, but more importantly, we've also done a lot of work with storage. Um, how many of you are familiar with Cinder? Okay. So, um, as you know, Cinder is highly pluggable. So, a lot of our um, three-part pro products that have HA capabilities and other things, we've tried to make those storage products work really well with, with Cinder. We've done a lot of work around um, not only some of the dedupe capabilities, some of the HA capabilities, and some of the encryption capabilities. Um, we also do a lot of work to ensure that our product works well with a variety of different things. If you were at the keynote this morning, you saw or come by the HP booth, right? HP Helion doesn't just run on HP hardware. It also runs on other people's hardware. It runs, runs with other people's storage. So we've tried, tried to work on ways of extending that, and we try to work on increasing the support for all of them. So um, we, work on, we work on that. We also support a number of different hypervisor technologies and continue to move forward to trying to support all of those. And then finally, talk a little bit about what's going on from an, an ecosystem perspective. Um, if you hearken back a small amount sort of in history back to earlier days of Linux, in the early days of Linux, as Linux was being developed, um, originally, it was a set of people who were interested in building the operating system, right? And Linux was really successful for three, re for three reasons, right? Small amount of computer history. Um, one, Leonis and others picked a, an open source license that most people understood. Some, some enterprises weren't necessarily all that comfortable with, but everybody kind of understood it, and it met sort of the needs of both IT companies enterprise companies, universities, and software developers. So it was a license that most people understood. The second thing was Linux was almost kind of a movement. It had a vibe, a, I'm trying to think what the hip term is, but you almost had like the equivalent of developer raves that went up, which are now, I think, the current buzzword is meetups. Um, but you had an environment where people really got together and wanted to advance this, and it was as much a social phenomenon as it was a technical phenomenon. And the third thing that made it really successful was four companies, five companies, right at the early stage of Linux, HP, Intel, IBM, one or two others, invested money in that movement and that activity and helped create a foundation around it. We've only seen that happen two other times in the history of open source. One is Apache and the second one is, uh, the other one is OpenStack, okay? But in all three of those instances, you created an environment where people participated in it and they were excited about it, but how could enterprises tell that it was starting to mature and become sort of fit for prime time? And, and where that comes in is when people start, not only enterprises looking at consuming it, but people in that ecosystem start consuming it. Meaning, when you see ISVs start talking about Okay, well, we currently run on Amazon, but our next, our, the next release of our product is going to run on OpenStack. Or people start looking at OpenStack that way. You have services companies that operate in it. This is my 
eighth or ninth OpenStack Summit. The first one I went to was, I dropped by the one that was in Santa Clara, but the first one I was actually, um, and, and in Boston, but the first one I was registered at was in San Francisco. In San Francisco, there were about 800 people there, and almost everybody showing there, or Boston, there was about 300. Everybody showing there down in the vendor floor were basically all, all vendors trying to talk to each other. Okay. Now when you walk through the vendor floor here, you're going to find consulting, consulting services, people who have applications that run on this stuff, people that make logging tools, make systems management tools, make other things. Right? Now you are in a situation where you have customers that are using this, but when they get up on stage and talk about it, they're not talking about how they took OpenStack and they built it themselves. They're talking about how they are using OpenStack and they're using it with these three other vendors and they're collaborating this way and they're, and they're using this public cloud and this public cloud. My point behind it is that, is that a sign or evidence of maturation is a rich growing ecosystem. It took Linux about eight to 10 years to get to that degree of maturation. It took a while, everybody adopted the you know, Apache web, ser web server, but it took a while for everybody to get to the stage where all of those tools were really rich and there were things for managing them um, and others. In the case of OpenStack, we've really been running in earnest for four and a half years. Um, and we're already seeing that. We started seeing this certainly in Atlanta, which was a year ago in terms of a lot of people there. Um, if you saw Comcast on the rolling living room, they've done a huge amount of things with this. But where we're starting to see it is um, in a huge amount of, of sort of partner spaces, validating third-party hardware, working with different bare metaling provisions, working with different types of technologies that are all coming in and the companies are collaborating with each other. We also see it in the aspect of very rich activities that HP has been doing around its own lifecycle management capabilities, but also how it plugs into others. So we've built things around centralized logging for cloud health. We've built things around uh, parallels automation, but we've also built things around our stuff working with, with other people. Um, how many of you are familiar with TSANet? Nobody in the room. So if TSANet is the backbone that whenever you do enterprise software, right, you'll get you know, Oracle running on something that's running on something else that's talking to some automation problem. And if you're a big bank and you're dead in the water and it doesn't work, you pick up the phone and you scream at the first person who answers the phone. But the problem most likely involves four separate companies working together. The thing underneath it that allows us to transmit problem cases and everything else to different vendors is TSANet. So if you go look at TSANet's website, you will now see tons and tons of OpenStack providers that are in there. So the ecosystem is reaching a level of maturity where you can call you can be running HP Helion on you know HP hardware but talking to a third party storage device. You call us with a problem with Helion, we tra we we realize it's the interaction between us and that storage vendor. We have the capability of routing that trouble case to them now and, and others. It's reached that degree of maturation. So it's become a very mature environment. Um, so I want to close with um, 10 things you probably don't know about HP Helion development platform and OpenStack. One, and hopefully you got it from at least part of my talk, uh, we have a fully featured PaaS, so platform as a service, that's really ready for enterprises and it's running on top of what we view at HP certainly is as an, as an enterprise ready packaging of all the OpenStack technology. And some of the speakers that Tim has, I think will, will give you some evidence and proof points for it. We have a fairly tight integration between Cloud Foundry and OpenStack because frankly, those, those of you that are old enough to remember how to write in C, how many, of, how many of you actually wrote applications where you talk directly to the system call interface? Okay, well actually I should say how many of you are actually old enough to write applications in C? But, anyway. um, but most of you probably wrote to an abstraction at a, at a layer higher than that. And that's really why we're, we're focused on this. Um, it comes, hopefully I've at least been able to exemplify to you that it's, it's kind of flexible and I've talked to you about the importance of portability, being able to move workloads from a private cloud to a managed cloud to a public cloud and more importantly, the ability to move workloads across different things in OpenStack. Um, we focused a lot on making it easy to administer. 
Um, and OpenStack is pretty difficult. As Mark said this morning, you know, you shouldn't need a PhD to be able to run this. And, and he's pretty true. Um, we've tried to focus a lot on a modern developer experience. I mean, I make jokes about C, but nobody really writes much in C anymore unless you're an operating systems geek, right? Um, most people are probably writing in Python, writing in, writing in Ruby, writing in a variety of different languages. Um, their developer experience is much, much different than it was you know, when I started my career. The type of support that developers want is drastically different than the type of support that sysadmins want. So we've spent a lot of time with our platform as a service organization building the types of support things that developers need from a support perspective. Um, HP is pretty much noted for providing 24 by 7 by 365 uh, world-class developer support. Um, so I don't think there's much question around that. We also have a pretty rich uh, professional services organization, product indemnification. And, and as a last comment, and sort of a tribute to Mr. Jobs. And just one more thing, uh, this maturing ecosystem. You know, the one more thing thing should have gotten a laugh, at least from one person. Um, so the final thing, and I guess it's the evidence for me that OpenStack is really here, is this maturing ecosystem. And as you walk around the conference, particularly those of you who are here for the first time, look at how sort of seasoned this has become, not in terms of how slick the presentations are, because they're not very slick, but in terms of who's actually here, and you should be able to go from the bottom of the stack all the way up to the top. So on that, um, thank you very much. I want you to uh, have a wonderful summit, and we are very committed to OpenStack. We are very committed to the open source nature of all of it. And thank you for your time, and I wish you a wonderful summit. Come by the booth, come by the, the pub crawl this evening, and certainly come by the HP party on Tuesday, Tuesday night. Thank you.